Well, I must confess my failure here at the very beginning. Uh, I did not get the updated sermon title for Rhoda this week in time, and that was my fault entirely. We're actually going to be finishing the second half of what we started last week, 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, we started in verse 12, and we went kind of down through verse 15, and that focused our thinking for the special service that we had last week. But I don't want to neglect the rest of the chapter before we jump into uh, chapter 2. So we're going to be thinking today about the foundation of faith. First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Thinking about the foundation of faith, the one that's on the screen is for next week, so now you already know what's coming up, don't you? Yeah. What is faith? We use that term a lot, don't we? What is faith? If you think about how it's used, and you have conversation with people, and they'll say, well, I have faith in whatever, oftentimes it's more like a generalized hope in the future, that somehow, we don't know how, but somehow things are going to get better. It's sort of a generalized hope in in the cosmos, the, the, the world in which we live. And somehow things are going to work out all right. That's really the idea behind karma. You know what karma is. It's that uh, Indian idea that you know, what goes around comes around. And you pay for your, your failures in another life. And that's a wrong theology, but it's kind of reflective of, of what we think when some people use the word faith, that, that there's some force out there, some principle out there in the universe that, you know, even though things might be bad right now, it, it, it's all going to work out. And, and that's the blind leap in the dark, that, that hope of faith that the world seems to have. It's very unfocused, it's very... Um, inaccurate, quite honestly. Collins Dictionary offers nine definitions or nine ways in which the word faith can be used. Number one is a strong or unshakable belief in something, and I want you to take note of this, especially without proof or evidence. Well, that fits with how the world uses the term, doesn't it? It's just kind of blind, hoping that things might get better somehow, some way. The uh, third, fourth um, definition is one based on theology. It says, it is a conviction of the truth of certain doctrines of religion, and notice this, especially when this is not based on reason. Hmm, that's curious. Webster's College Dictionary, published by Random House, says this, that faith is a belief that is not based on proof. Really? Is that what our faith is all about? Do the college de uh, dictionary definitions capture the definition of faith as it appears in Scripture? I hope not. I hope you have a better concept of what faith is. In Scripture, it is used as a belief, a settled condition of the mind. And it's not only that, but it's connected with something. It is connected with confidence in someone. Faith always has an object to which it is attached. It is always faith in something, faith in someone. You are exercising faith right now at this moment by sitting on those pews. You came in and you looked at those nice, strong, sturdy wooden things and you said, you know what, I believe that thing's going to hold me up. And so you rested your whole weight upon those pews. And lo and behold, it works. It, 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 but it was not a blind leap in the dark, was it? You understand the, the principles of wood and carpentry and and you've seen these things in action week after week. And so there was knowledge that strengthened and established your faith in those pews. And you acted upon it. 
Faith is the foundation upon which decisions are made and which lives are built. Keep your finger in 2 Peter chapter 1, but turn back just a few pages to Hebrews chapter 11. This is another great memory verse that perhaps we will work on together sometime. Maybe some of you already have it nailed down, and that's great if you do. It's, it's a definition, a biblical definition of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance. You ought to circle that word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence. You ought to circle that word. The evidence of things not seen. The word substance there refers to the substructure, the foundation. Something that has actual existence. Something that has real being. That's how it's used in the Greek language. New American Standard and English Standard Version translate with the word assurance. The NIV says being sure. The New Living Translation says confidence. Holman Christian Standard says the reality. It is the substance. All of those different translators are trying to grasp on to what that original word means in the Greek language that faith is the evidence. It is the solid, rock-solid foundation upon which our lives are built. Our hopes are built on a solid foundation. The word evidence is the word for proof. Something by which a thing is proved or tested. It is a manifestation or a showing of the facts. The demonstration of the veracity. That's the truthfulness of a thing. That does not sound like that wimpy, mamby, pamby uh, definition in the dictionary, does it? That faith is based on nothing. Faith is based on a hope. Faith is certainly not based on evidence. It's certainly not based on reason. Is there a prejudice in the dictionary writers against genuine faith? I think so. If you were to go back and read the 1828 Webster's original dictionary, he defines faith with all kinds of scriptural allusions and references. Beloved, as believers in Jesus Christ, our faith is the place, it's the crossroads where truth and hope, facts and feeling, the material world and the spiritual world, our present reality and our future hope all intersect right there at that point of faith. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Or the substance, excuse me, of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You and I live in two worlds. We live in the here and now with all of the things that are going on in our world. But we also live by faith with Christ in glory. And it is that intersection, that crossroad, where you and I work and live and make decisions and take actions every single day. We see what's on the news. And by faith, we realize that God is in control. God raises up kingdoms and God puts down kingdoms. God moves armies from one end of the globe to the other end of the globe. All to do His bidding, even though the individuals involved may have no clue that they are tools in the hands of Almighty God. And so realizing that God is sovereign, realizing that God is in control, we walk by faith. We know that the world is coming apart because of sin, 
But it is not out of control because God is on the throne. And whatever happens in this world does not take Almighty God by surprise. So where are we going to discover all this truth? I mean, is this something that I just made up this morning? Is this something that, you know, we just kind of hope for? Are the dictionary definitions right? That it's really without any foundation at all? No. This is not something that's made up. And that's why Peter, and let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, that's why Peter launches into this little discussion about the truthfulness, the rock-solid foundation of God's revelation of Himself to mankind, particularly in the written Word. Let's take a look at what he says. Verse 15 is where I'm going to pick it up. You know, last time he was talking about reminding, 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 that we constantly need to be reminded of these truths. Moreover, he says in verse 15, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. And 2 Peter is a part of that reminder. It's a written letter to believers from Peter under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit to serve as a continual, perpetual, may I even say an eternal <coughs> reminder of what God has revealed. Verse 16, We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory <coughs> When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Peter wants them to remember these things. He's writing things down for them. He'd already written one letter. This is now the second letter. He's going to refer to the writings of Paul later on in this very book, in this very letter. Peter understood that the writings of the Apostle Paul were the authoritative, inspired, written word of God. Peter got that. Peter also has in mind the entire Old Testament. Peter was a good Jew. He grew up on all that. He knew that in the former times, God spoke His word through His prophets. So when he says, I'm going to try to stir all this up in your mind and bring it to remembrance, he's encompassing both the Old and the New Testament. This is God's Word to us. Let's look at verse 16. He says, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Cunningly devised fables. The word there is myth, muthos. A myth is something that's made up in an effort to explain what we don't understand. So what would have been some of the myths that would have been prevalent in Peter's day? Well, I remember when I was in high school taking Latin class on Friday, we would have um, Latin culture day. And, and it would be a study of Rome and the empire and the cultural milieu. Here's that. That's a nice word, isn't it? I haven't used that since high school. <laughs> the cultural surroundings of, of what we were reading in Latin. And part of that included a study of the Roman gods and goddesses. And they had all kinds of fantastic stories that were attached to these 12 particular deities. And, and then there were other kind of demiurges and all this was kind of a mess. But anyway, 
And, and it was the ancient world's attempt to explain itself apart from the truth. They were myths. They were stories made up, designed to keep people in ignorance of the truth. And the behavior that was exhibited by those 12 primary gods and goddesses was no different and often was far worse than the behavior of the people that they were supposed to be in charge of. It was terrible. These myths that Peter is talking about also included a lot of Jewish mysticism and all kinds of different angels and emanations from God and, and Gnosticism and things of that sort. All of those things we see in our world today. CNN, NBC, CBS, all, MSNBC, all of those alphabet soup places are, are not designed or have the purpose of communicating truth. They are providing myths, elaborate fables, to spin whatever particular system of thought and belief they want you to consider and to accept. This world, this whole world, the whole system of this world is not designed to perpetuate truth. It is designed to perpetuate these false stories, these myths. It was a problem in the early church. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses four, 3 and 4. 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 and 4. Just listen as I read. As I urged you, when I went into Macedonia, you remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables, that's our word, myths, and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. Paul was dealing with this problem in his day. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith, and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables. That's the same word, myths. And exercise yourself toward godliness. Again, he writes, this time he's describing the church in the latter days. Warning Timothy what's to come. He says, for the time will come when they, that is professing believers, will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear what the Word of God has to say. They will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to myths. Little stories designed to deceive. Little stories designed to blind people to the truth. Titus. Paul writes to young Titus, another pastor. He says, therefore rebuke them, and that's those who have wormed their way into the church, sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables, there's our word, myths, and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. Paul is warning Titus about people within the professing church. He says they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. I don't know if Paul had our current denomination in mind when he wrote those words, but beloved, that is true. Of so many denominations, they have an appearance of religion, they have an appearance of, of Christ, they use his name, but in practice they are so far from the truth. 
They are apostates. They have turned aside to myths, little stories made up to lead people away from the truth. In works they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Now we're going to talk more about false teachers next time. But Paul, or Peter, is writing so that these dear folks do not become confused about the foundation upon which their faith is built. Peter says in verse 16, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. It's a reference to the transfiguration. It's written for us in Matthew 17, Mark 9, Luke 9, where Jesus took Peter, James, and John, went up on the top of a mountain, and there he was transfigured. He was changed from the inside out. What was inside was, <laughs> was let out. And he appeared in glory, radiant, brilliant, bright glory, light. And there was a voice from heaven which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It was a, a, a re-display, a new display of the glory of God that had been revealed in the Old Testament through that cloud and that pillar of fire that led the Israelites along in the wilderness. It was another display of that glory that appeared in the night sky on the night in which the Messiah was born that attracted the attention of the wise men and eventually led them to the very house where Jesus was then living with his parents. That moment on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus appeared before his disciples in all of his glory and the voice from heaven came he demonstrated to those disciples who were gathered with him that he was indeed God in the flesh. Peter says we were eyewitnesses of that. We saw it with our own eyes. And there were two other occasions in Scripture where something amazing and similar happened. Not exactly, but something similar that was witnessed and heard by others. In John chapter 12, this is just before the final Passover, Jesus is praying for God to glorify himself in his name. And the Father answers audibly from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And others heard it. And then there was that amazing display of Jesus' divinity and power on the night in which he was betrayed. He was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas and the religious leaders and the mob came to get him. And Jesus goes out. He walks out and he meets them. And he says, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am. And they all fell back. They all just collapsed on the ground. And amazingly enough, they got up and they, they, they came after him again. But in that moment, I don't know if it was a light. I don't know if it was just a feeling. I don't know what it was. But in that moment when Jesus pronounced his own divine name, I am, all of those people who came fell back in recognition of his deity. We have eyewitness accounts. Eyewitnesses. And we have the testimony from God the Father who not only at the transfiguration said, this is my beloved son, but at his baptism, at the beginning of his public ministry, as a public announcement to all those gathered there who saw Jesus immersed in the water and the Spirit of God coming down and descending upon him, the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. There's eyewitness testimony. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the resurrected Jesus appeared to over 500 brethren at once and he says most of whom are still alive to this day. He's writing 1 Corinthians some years afterward and, and maybe a few of them have died. 
But what's his invitation? It's that, hey, if you want to know that Jesus Christ is risen, there's about 500 people you can ask. Go check it out. Go, go get the eyewitness testimony. This is not a blind leap in the dark. This is not a nameless, unfocused hope on something or someone we don't know at all, but in the cosmos that's going to set things right. No, Peter is building and, and pointing out the strong foundation upon which we base our decision to believe that Jesus is who he claims to be. That's faith. It is the intersection between facts and feelings, between faith and hope, between reality and future hope, all the material and the spiritual world. Faith is that intersection. And we stand on that solid rock and we choose Christ and all that he offers us. He goes on in verse 18. We heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Some translations have made more, more sure. What is this prophetic word? I believe it refers to the entire Old Testament. And to all of the New Testament that up to Peter's moment here had already been written. The Apostle Paul and, and, and uh, the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Well, not John. John was written probably in the 90s, the Gospel, along with some other passages, uh, uh, books, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. But all of that content is the prophetic word. We, we tend to limit that word, prophetic, to just future events. But what was the role of the prophet in the Old Testament? Was he the guy that just showed up when somebody wanted to know what was happening in the future? No. The Old Testament prophet was a very present tense, this world focused kind of guy. He had several roles. Number one was to call the people into a relationship with Almighty God. He, he, was, he was the evangelist, if you will. And he was also the conscience of the nation. The prophet was the one that God sent to the people and said, you have abandoned Almighty God. Stop worshiping these idols. Stop following in the way of all of, of the nations surrounding you. Worship the Lord God. The prophet was the guy who got in the face of kings and said, you're guilty. You're wrong. You're the man. That was the function of the Old Testament prophet. And to call them to a place of repentance. Now where the prophet got into some of the future stuff is when he would say, and if you don't repent, here's what's going to happen. And now he's dealing with future issues. But all of it is the result of God revealing to that prophet God's message to God's people. God's message even to the whole world. So what Peter is saying here, he's, he's not talking about just you know, future events. He says, listen, we have that more sure word from God. It is the written word. Experience is important. But you can have all kinds of experiences that may or may not line up with the truth. How do you know what a legitimate experience is and what a deception is? The only way you know that is if you line it up with the Word. If you look into God's Word and your experience 
is in line with what God reveals to be true in His Word, then you can you can rejoice in that and you can you can thank God for that experience. But if it doesn't line up, guess what? <coughs> Throw it out. I don't care how intense, how personal, how emotional, whatever. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it is a deception. The Word of God is the foundation upon which we build our lives because it comes to us from God through His prophets by means of the Holy Spirit. Notice, he says, we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed. In other words, to accept it, to believe it, to obey it. If you want to go on a trip and you get your map out and you plan out your trip and you look at the drawing there of the map and how the roads go, if you want to get to your destination, you've got to follow the map. Don't you? If you're going down the road and you say, oh, that looks like an interesting road over there. Throw the map out the window. Let's see where this goes. Who knows where you're going to end up? Probably not where you want to be. But an awful lot of people live life that way. They get a hold of this book and they start to look at it and they you know, eh, I don't know, it's a little hard to understand. That looks interesting over there. I think maybe I'll go that way. And they throw the book out and expect that they're going to end up in God's presence and be received by him. <laughs> no, they won't. They will ultimately end up in his presence at the great white throne judgment, and they will hear only that word of condemnation. Depart from me. I never knew you. This, this is the book. This is our roadmap. This is, this is our life. This is our foundation upon which we build our lives. And not just our lives here, but our eternal lives in the future. And if we build on the wrong foundation, we will be lost. He says you do well to heed it until the day dawns. What is he talking about? Is he talking about sunrise tomorrow morning? No. He's using a phrase that we find frequently in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord, the day, the day of Almighty God, that sort, that little phrase, the day, sort of became almost a technical phrase in the Jewish world, referring to the time when God would break into this world and establish His kingdom, and the Jewish nation would be on the top of the world. And that's true. Now, there's a lot in that package that they didn't always get, but that's what Peter's referring to. It's the return of Jesus Christ. It's a specific day. This is our great hope. And Peter's going to talk about that day later on in chapter 2 and 3. But that's our hope. Do we not long for the Lord to return? I do. If he came back before this sermon was finished, that would be the most blessed thing that you would ever experience. You can laugh. <laughs> it's okay. You know. it, 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 would be, it would be the greatest thing that would ever happen. Because we would be in the presence of Almighty God. What a great thing that would be. That's our hope. Scripture even calls it our blessed hope. The rapture of the church, the removal of God's people just prior to that tribulation, which is part of that day, the day of the Lord. It's the grace of God in Second, uh, excuse me, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. Peter says, you know, pay attention to the word, right? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to that. 
We're longing for that. We're hoping for that. That's what we want to see. We do not want to be living a life of ungodliness when Jesus Christ appears. Sin should be coming less and less and less and less a part of our lives. We should be growing in our faith, growing in our obedience, growing in righteousness and holiness, becoming more like Jesus Christ every day. So that when he appears, we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome into the presence of your Lord. And the morning star rises in your hearts. That's an interesting phrase. You do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns. In other words, until Jesus returns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That's a reference to Jesus himself. In Numbers chapter 14, 24, Balaam pronounces a prophecy about Judah. And he says that he sees him, but not now. He senses him, but far away. A star will rise in Judah, and the scepter <clears throat> will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, until the one, the, the, the Messiah, basically, the one who brings peace. Jesus is that Messiah. He is that peace bringer. He is that star that rises. And if you look at the book of Revelation in chapter 22, Jesus identifies himself as that. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Now, you and I have Christ in our hearts now, don't we? What do you think it's going to be like when Jesus appears to take us home? Right now, our hearts are divided, aren't they? Uh, we're all concerned about this world. We're concerned about heaven, but heaven seems a long way off. I still have to pay my bills this week, and you know, you do too, and we still have to make decisions. We still have to get up and go to work. All the mundane stuff of life, we're still here. Our heart is kind of divided, isn't it? But when Jesus Christ returns, is our heart going to be divided anymore? <laughs> we are going to be so filled with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to be so enamored with Him. There is going to be one thought and one thought only that fills our entire being, and that is the glory and greatness and mercy and majesty and love and forgiveness and peace of Jesus Christ. He's going to be all that there is. Peter is reminding his readers, listen, You've got to look at the Word. You've got to obey the Word. You've got to do what God says. You've got to be built on this firm foundation because when the day dawns, when Jesus comes back and the morning star floods your heart, that is your goal. That is what you long for. That's what you're looking for and hoping for. That's what you're building your life upon. Verse 21, or verse 21. Knowing this first, no prophecy of, of Scripture is of any private interpretation. That's an interesting word, and the, the translators struggle with it. The word means to set something loose. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, Grace to You Ministries and Dr. John MacArthur there in California. He's had a little tagline that he's used as a part of the, the public ministry, the, the radio and television ministry. It's called Unleashing God's Truth One Verse at a Time. That's the idea. The unleashing part. The, the loosing it. it. When God gave His Word, it was not for the purpose of anybody just trying to bring some explanation to it out of the fancifulness of their own heads. I mean, I've heard some fanciful explanations of Scripture through the years. I'm sure you have too. Some to explain it away, some to twist it and distort it, but some fanciful explanations. The Word of God is not coming for any crazy interpretation. 
But rather, prophecy did not come by the will of man. It doesn't find its origin. It's, not, its source is not in the ideas of men. And because its source is not in the ideas of men, the understanding of it, the unloosing of it, does not come from just the ideas of men. Rather, its holy men of God were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's a word that's used sometimes to describe the water floating a ship, bearing up the ship, keeping it upright. The Spirit of God comes along and works in the hearts of men like Peter and Paul and James and John and Matthew and, and Isaiah and King David and others and, and does this in an amazing way. I can't describe it adequately, but the Spirit of God carries them along in such a way that their own vocabulary, their own personality, their own writing style is very evident and yet what they have written is absolutely God-breathed. It is as though God spoke it Himself. Because He did. That's what the word God-breathed means. Inspired. When, when you talk, you know, you, you take breath in, you put breath out, you can feel that sometimes. That's the word that's used. The Spirit of God bore these men along, not only with the message, but with the understanding of the message. So that we see in Psalm 119, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. God, you open my eyes. I'm not going to figure this word out all by myself. You open my eyes so that I can see what you are saying. If you want to know what someone has written, do you go to the author or do you go to some guy on the street for an explanation? You go to the author, right? If I've written something and, and given it to you and you don't understand what I'm trying to say, well, because I'm a fallible human being, maybe I didn't get it said right. But if you want to understand, you've got to come and ask me. You can't go ask somebody else because they don't know what was in my head. If we want to understand what God has to say, who do we have to go and see? Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. That's what Peter's telling us here. Listen, God has communicated to us Holy men of God who were born along by the Spirit have, have written that communication down faithfully. We need to pay attention to it. We need to understand it. And the best place to understand it is to ask God to give us understanding and, and build our lives upon it. And this written word, this prophetic word that began way back in the Old Testament and continues all the way through the book of Revelation, this prophetic word from God is more sure than an eyewitness account. You can build your life on this book. Beloved, we need to be people of the book. Some of us are more interested in the morning newspaper than we are in the Word of God. Some of us spend far, far more time looking at all the news sources on the internet than we spend looking at God's Word. Is it any wonder that so many people are terrified? Is it any wonder that so many people are deceived? Is it any wonder that so many people are experiencing anxiety and depression in record numbers because we've got our eyes on the world and we don't have our eyes fixed on God. Our faith has become something that just hangs out there on nothing because it's faith in nothing. And you can't live like that, beloved. Your faith has to be grounded in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is revealed 
in this book. We have got to become students of this book. We've got to. This is the thing that God uses to guide our lives and to anchor our souls in the midst of trouble. That's why I've tried to be very careful in choosing the verses of Scripture that we have been memorizing over this past year. Because I want in some small way to get an anchor firmly embedded into your heart and mind. Something that will be with you no matter what the circumstances of life might be. That you can turn again, even in your mind, in your memory, to the Word of God that you've put there so that you know how to live in these days. Let's be good students of the book. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there's so much that we could spend time talking about and thinking about this morning. We are so thankful that you have given us your word, your written, inspired, authoritative, inerrant word. Lord Jesus, that, that just does not go well with people today because they want to throw out your word. They don't want the assurance of it. They don't want the boundaries of it. They don't want the responsibility that comes with having it. So they try very hard to get rid of it. But your word will endure forever. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be firmly grounded in you upon your word. Thank you for providing it for us. Thank you for inspiring your servants to record these things for us. Thank you for preserving it through all of these centuries. Thank you for giving us an understanding of your word. And Father, may we always, always, always come to you and ask for wisdom, ask for understanding. Open our eyes, Lord, that we can behold those wondrous truths, wondrous things out of your word. Preserve us, Father, from those deceptions that would seek to lead us astray, those, those myths that are carefully, carefully crafted to deceive. Father, help us to be discerning. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Beloved, you're here this morning, and you have been trying to build your life on something other than Jesus Christ. You are building on sand. You are building on air. You are building on nothingness. Today, I would encourage you, please, build your life on Jesus Christ and revealing His Word. It begins by acknowledging that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of salvation, and asking Him to forgive you. And from that moment forward, you are forgiven you are adopted as a child of God and you can begin to have the kind of life that brings joy to your heart here and honors God here and in eternity. So I would encourage you to know if you don't know Christ as your Savior, don't walk out that door without giving your heart to Him. I'd be glad to talk to you and meet you up front after the service today. And any of the folks up here you saw this morning would be more than delighted talk with you and pray with you. Don't leave this place without making that decision.